Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on the time zone that you're in. Thank you for joining us for this review of uh, lessons learned out of the GIST National Analytics Project. My name is Kate Valenti. I'm the VP of Operations for Unicon. We're an educational technology consultancy located in Arizona, and we have had the pleasure of serving GIST as a, a partner and a consultant on their analytics projects. So happy to, to share some, some findings with you today. With me, I have two co-presenters, so Michael Webb from JISC, as well as Dr. Itel Loria from Marist College. I'm going to turn it over to Michael and Itel to introduce themselves thoroughly, and then uh, Michael will jump in. We'll go ahead and get started. Michael? Hi, everyone. So um, it's afternoon for me here in the UK. I'm Director of Technology and Analytics for JISC. We are a members organization in the UK serving universities and colleges. We provide things like the network, um, license collections of library resources, provide help and advice. Um, and my area is R&D section where we're creating new services and learning analytics is one of the new services we're creating. Patel? Yeah, I'm Ethel Laurie. I'm a professor at the School of Computer Science and Mathematics at Mary's College, located in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, 80 miles north of New York City, overlooking the beautiful Hudson River. Here it is, uh, 10 a.m., uh, so we are in the Poughkeepsie uh, Coast. Uh, our school, uh, our college has done a good amount of work in learning analytics. It's kind of pioneered the discipline in particular in terms of doing early detection of uh, students at risk, as we're going to be discussing throughout this webinar. Great, thanks. So, let's see if. Yes. So, um, I'm going to kick off. I'm going to um, give you an overview of um, our project, about what we wanted to solve, what the national issues were in the UK, and then um, describe the architecture that we're creating. I'm then going to hand over to Artel, who's going to go into a lot more detail about how the predictive modeling works, and then Kate is going to give some detail on the actual implementation. And hopefully we'll have some time for discussion at the end. So bear with me while I just click correctly. So I'm going to start off just by explaining what we mean by learning analytics. Um, so we, we generally mean um, for our project, the application of big data techniques, things like machine learning, um, data mining, to help both learners and institutions meet their goals. And generally there are kind of four main goals that people want to look at, improving retention, um, improving achievement, employability, and um, increasingly then improving learning design. Um, so, in the process, we really see a number of stages in learning analytics. Um, one way of looking at it is these three stages, so basic analytics, um, understanding what has happened, automated analytics, so gathering data and understanding what is happening, and then predictive analytics, um, what might happen. So um, the predictive side is very much a, a core element of our project, so at an individual student level, predicting who might drop out, who might not get the grades they should. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a UK context. Um, so first of all, retention. Um, we've got two groups that we serve in JISC, um, 16 to 18 year olds, um, and then undergraduates and university students. Um, we've had in 2012-13, for example, nearly 180,000 students aged 16 to 18 failed to finish their courses. It costs the UK economy um, nearly um, a billion pound a year, so hugely expensive. Our dropout rates undergraduate around 8%, that costs institutions around 33,000 a student. So it's a significant amount of money is at stake. Um, the secondary issue is um, differential achievement. 
So we're seeing that the background of students, um, ethnicity, um, parents' education impact the degree they get out of. So here are a couple of examples. Um, if students' parents have a degree, the student is far more likely to come out with an upper class degree. If they are white, they are far more likely to come out with an upper class degree. Now you might think that is just because um, of things that happened before they come to university. But actually that's not what we're seeing. Um, we're actually seeing um, a difference in what they achieve even when they come in with the same grades. So in the UK, students typically come in with A-levels, three of them graded A to E, um, either that or a, a number of points. Um, in the graph here, you can see um, black minority ethnic group students um, in the darker access. So even when, for example, um, they come in with a BBB um, set of grades, white students still achieve more than them and um, are far more likely to get a um, upper class degree. So quite clearly, it's not just things that happened before they got to university. There are things that happen when they're at university that um, we can hopefully affect. So bear my pause while I end my slides. I get a lag between clicking next and the next slide appearing. Um, one particular thing we've got happening in the UK is a teaching excellence framework. Um, this is a fairly new initiative, or it's a very new initiative. It's somewhat controversial. Um, we've had a research excellence framework for a long time. The teaching excellence framework um, is going to rank the universities gold, silver or bronze based on their teaching. So obviously um, this has made them much more focused on the quality of their teaching, particularly as those that are ranked gold are able to charge more for students than those that rank bronze. So um, as well as kind of a, a ethical kind of driver to do the right thing, there's now a financial driver as well. So I'm just going to now go through what JISC is doing. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, GIST's role is to create um, and provide national services. We go through a process called co-design where we ask the sector what they want us to do. Learning analytics was one of the areas that um, come up as core interest. So, we've got a project and there are three strands to it. First is creating a national architecture and service. And I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail shortly. Next is what we're calling a toolkit. So it's a bunch of things to help you implement learning analytics, not tools, but supporting material. We've got um, a discovery phase that Kate will tell you a little bit about later, where we um, get institutions to understand their readiness to learning analytics. We've got guides and so on. Then we've got community. So in, in any new era, I think getting people to work together is really important. We hold um, national events where anyone interested comes together um, three or four times a year to discuss practical issues around learning analytics. Um, we get about 100 attendees for those. We've got a very active blog and mailing list. And we are adding to those now Pathfinder events for institutions that have, have started implementing and want to work with a group of like-minded institutions. When we started the project, the first thing that we actually um, did was look at the ethical side. And this was partly learning from um, other projects and why they succeeded or not. And um, we worked on a code of practice. So one of my colleagues did a very thorough literature review. So we gathered all the evidence about the issues affecting learning analytics. We then um, distilled this down into a code of practice. And crucially, we worked with our national union students on this. So um, they also cite our code of practice in the guidance they give to the universities on learning analytics. So by doing that first, we think we've got everyone comfortable with the general concept. If we then move on to the architecture, what we're doing really is three strands. It's building a national architecture, defining standards and models, and then implementing core services on the architecture. So the reasons we're doing this, um, first of all, standards mean that things like the models, the visualizations and so on could all be shared. Um, we can lower the cost through shared infrastructure. And crucially, we can lower the barrier to innovation so the architecture covers a lot of the kind of um, basic work, allowing um, other people to focus on um, new ideas, new approaches to learning analytics. 
so I'm just going to walk us through what this actually looks like in practice. Um, first of all, I'll just touch upon what we mean by open architecture, which is how we describe it. So it doesn't mean it's open source, although most of the elements are. What it means is that all the APIs and standards are all um, completely open, developed in the open, and anyone can contribute to them, um, spit ideas and so on. So the data models and definitions of Creative Commons, um, it's all developed on GitHub. Anyone can have a look at it and, and join in. And then there's complete freedom to implement commercial or open source um, solutions on the architecture. So this diagram um, sums up the architecture. So the first thing is that the blue elements are the core elements. So these are the bits that um, everyone taking part in the architecture gets. And then the red bits are where people can choose their own or choose not to put anything at all. So um, I'll walk us through the layers. At the bottom, we've got data collection. And the idea here is that we gather data in a standard format. The standard formats, as I said before, are developed in the open on GitHub. Um, we use XAPI for activity data. And we have our own model called the universal student definition that describes a student. We gather date data through plugins and extract, transform, and load mechanisms. Um, so, for example, we've got a plugin from for Blackboard and Moodle that outputs data in our standard format. Um, we've got a number of um, recipes for getting data out of different student record systems in the various formats. So, at the moment, we've concentrated on um, student data, so that's about them, what course they're doing, what their background is, their marks. Self-declared data is things they add in from our student app. ELE or learning management system, Blackboard, Moodle, etc. Library, earlier stage, but we're looking at things like reading list data, access to electronic resource. And then we've got two sets of question marks, um, blue and red. So the blue ones are things that um, JISC are developing. We're looking at things like attendance and presence. And red are other people's ideas, um, suppliers, having systems they want to implement. The data all goes into the learning records warehouse, which sits in the center of the next layer. So this is a shared national resource. It's multi-tenanted, so each institution gets its own space. The data's all in the same format. Um, that means that they can um, run whatever applications they want on it and only share data with, other, um, with suppliers and with other institutions if they actually choose to. Next to that, we've got the learning analytics processor. So this is the bit that takes the data and, and predicts whether the student's going to succeed. Um, in our project, we've got two of these. We've got an open source one based on the Imperio Foundations um, suite. And we have a commercial offering by Tribal called Student Insights. And we've got a whole bunch of other suppliers that are coming on to add in their predictive engine into the framework as an option as well. If we jump up, at the top layer then, we've got the things that people can do with learning analytics. The most obvious thing is dashboards. Um, when we started the project, it was dashboards that people asked for. The problem with dashboards is that people actually have to look at them. And typically, we'll see that those that are good and understand what's going on actually are the people that look at dashboards anyway. So what we want is some kind of mechanism where somebody whose actual job it is to act on a prediction gets the data. So this is where the alert and intervention system comes in. In our framework, um, we are offering a version of student success plan to institutions and our pilots, and we've got a number of other similar um, products coming on board that can sit in that space. But the idea is the learning analytics processor um, calculates a student is like to be at risk, emits a message um, to somebody whose job it is to deal with that. They then make a human decision on what should do and um, deal with it. What we want to happen then is that system to push the intervention back into the learning records warehouse so we can start understanding what interventions actually make a difference. In the centre, we've got consent. Um, early on, we thought this was going to be a system where all students consented to be part of learning analytics. We've realised that that's not actually the legal case. 
it's now part of the student app um, and allows students to add additional um, consent to do things like share data with friends, um, activity data with friends and so on within the student app, which is the next element I'll come to. The student app is an example of the sort of app you can build on top of Learning Analytics. Um, it's seamlessly modelled on a fitness app, so students can take their learning data and do all sorts of fitness related um, things or, or parallels with fitness so they can compare their activity with friends, they can add um, friends, they can set themselves goals and um, record their um, progress against the goals, all of that kind of thing. So we realised this won't work for all students but um, for those that enjoy this kind of thing it works well. The last bit yeah, we're good there now. <laughs> but then is Data Explorer. This is our basic visualization tool. So, for the moment, institutions put um, information in the learning records that can warehouse things, exploring a preset number of visualizations um, to understand activity at a module level, at an institution level, and so on. Then we've got more red question marks. So, these are other things that people can build on top of the architecture. So we're just putting together the final stages of a um, process to bring suppliers on board. We've got a lot that are interested. Um, they can essentially use our open APIs to build on top of the learning records warehouse, um, access data with consent from the institutions and do interesting things with it. So that's a summary of our architecture. I'm now going to hand over to Patel. Yeah. So, following um, on what Michael was saying, in uh, the US back in 2010, uh, higher education statistics were really alarming. Uh, let's take a look at some of these uh, figures. The figures are considerably better now, but we still have a long way to go. As you can see in the slide, as reported by, at the time by the U.S. Department of Education and College Board, the four-year uh, um, graduation rate across all colleges and universities in the U.S. was 36%. When we look at Black students, the number went down to 21%. When looking at Latino students, the number was 25%. It gets a little better with six-year graduation rates, 58% uh, overall, but 40% for Black students and 49% for Hispanic students. And a rather depressing statistic, only 41% of the 25 to 34-year-old population had an associate degree or higher, placing the U.S. in 12th place among 36 developed nations. Not great. Uh, not great at all. So, uh, so uh, these uh, numbers were a huge motivation for higher education institutions to do better for their students. Uh, and that's how uh, we at Mary's College got involved in this project. In 2010, CityCons launched an initiative called Next Generation Learning Challenges, which was funded through the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. At Mary's, we set up a team of data scientists and educators and presented a proposal, and we won the bid. It was the first wave of the NGLC. Uh, to explore the feasibility of developing an early alert prototype that uh, should be able to detect academically at risk students in initial weeks of a course and then deploy intervention on those students uh, to improve their chances of success. Uh, I led the development of the early detection model. We added a twist to the project. Uh, the framework should be based on a set of open source tools. The idea was to create an open source ecosystem. Maris has been an advocate of Sakai, one of the main open source learning management systems. Uh, for those uh, not familiar with uh, the concept of uh, learning management systems, uh, they are uh, mostly a web portal that the instructor uses to post uh, course and session materials, 
uh, but also has a variety of tools, internal email, discussion forums, assignments, test tools. It keeps partial contributions to the final grade uh, in a grade book and, and so on. For analytics, we use uh, one of the best well-known uh, business intelligence uh, uh, tools, uh, open source tools, Tentaho, which is a Java-based open source platform. And we used, uh, in particular, two components of it. Weaker, which is a Java-based machine learning library. It was originally developed at the University of Waikato in New Zealand and has been very popular in academia for many years. And uh, then Kettle, which is a mature uh, data integration ETL. We also sought collaboration with uh, IBM. We used SPSS Modeler for rapid prototyping, given its versatility. We didn't have much time for the execution of the project. So this was kind of a blessing as we were moving uh, uh, forward. Um, so let me see. OK. Good. Uh, so this is the architecture of what we describe as a single node uh, learning analytics uh, processor. Our unit of analysis is the student performance in a given course. Uh, and the problem is presented as a binary classification problem in the sense that uh, we recoded the grade uh, of a student in a course by placing a threshold. So any grade um, below uh, a letter C uh, a grade letter C implies that the student is at risk, above that the student is in good stand. And for uh, data sources, if you take a look at the sources in gray uh, to the right of this uh, chart, to the left of this chart, I mean, uh, we have student academic data that includes previous academic performance, such as standardized tests in the US, for example, SATs and ACTs. Cumulative GPA grade in a course, which is the target feature, what we're looking for. Course characteristics, course size, type of course. Then the student demographic data that comprises age, gender, ethnicity, income level. And then the learning management system log data. And this was innovative as it is a measure of activity, uh, but could also be seen as a surrogate for effort. And for that, we uh, collected and created predictors out of the number of times the student accesses the uh, LMS, number of times the student accesses resources within the LMS, access lessons within the LMS, posts uh, in forums, post assignments, and so on. Finally, partial contributions to a final grade. We derive a metric using gradebook data. And this was also innovative because uh, I have to think that uh, generally speaking, uh, in partial contributions to a final grade are the territory of students and faculty, but it's not administrative data available administratively until the end of the semester, and that's sometimes too late because at that time a student being at risk may have failed or done poorly in the course. And let me switch again. So, uh, actually, uh, let me go back for a second. Uh, there are a number of data quality hurdles to overcome, mostly based on differences between courses. Some are easy to address, but some are not, as they are tied to the LMS usage, which implies uh, lots of holes in the data, basically. Uh, uh, at the time, we used MARIS as a test bed, although MARIS is not particularly interesting. In any given semester, we have between three to five students, three to five percent of students at risk. Uh, we run pilots at two historically black colleges and universities, Savannah State and North Carolina Agricultural and Technical Universities, and two community colleges in California, College of the Redwoods and Cerritos. And we got encouraging results. Uh, we got uh, recall values ranging between 73% and 87%. Uh, to give you an idea of the metric, uh, this means that the percentage of students detected by the classifier over the total number of students at risk, which meant that we were able to capture a large percentage of the students that were effectively 
uh, at risk. Okay, uh, I'm doing badly with the uh, moving of the slides. So uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, I would say we started working on the next iteration of the predictive platform with the purpose of creating a reference architecture which would scale well uh, with more volume and variety of data. The purpose in this case was twofold. Uh, in one hand, consider much larger volumes of data. MICE is a small school we have, for example, for more than, a little bit more than 4,000 undergraduate students. There are much larger uh, institutions at MARIS where the integration process is substantial and can be very time consuming. But also the idea of adding other sources of data, such as student engagement data, library data, social network data, which by nature uh, could be semi-structured or non-structured data, and where the volume can be considerably uh, bigger. The natural evolution was towards a uh, um, big data uh, platform, and we based it on Hadoop. Uh, and Spark, uh, given the relevance of these technologies in the big data space. And this is the environment in which we're working uh, today. You take a look at the slide, uh, the, the uh, square in red describes the integration component. Most of the current ETL is uh, done in Hive. Hive is one of the tools within the uh, Hadoop ecosystem as it was easy to port all the SQL code from the previous environment to this environment. The predictive modeling component was done in Spark. We, cho we chose the Python uh, API given that Python is uh, a well spread uh, uh, software platform out there with lots of developers with good uh, handling uh, of this platform. And we use ML, which is uh, one of the main uh, machine learning libraries within Spark. And this is where we uh, stand uh, today. Let me uh, show you some uh, outcomes. So uh, in the new cluster computing platform, we replicated the tests on Mary's data, uh, obtaining as expected similar values. As you can see in the slide, 87% recall, 14% of ports alarm rates. We run pilots at North Carolina State University with slightly different predictors in the mall, and we got results of 77% recall and 18% uh, false positive. When focusing on online courses, and therefore a better set of predictors, you have to consider that uh, when you're dealing with online courses, the set of uh, uh, activity metrics are usually much more uniform and data has more less holes, basically, less missing data. In that case, the malls uh, uh, yielded 82% of recall with a similar percentage of false positives. Since last year, we're working with DISC to develop learning analytics components for the DISC open source learning analytics and student intervention IT infrastructure. We have done work on four institutions. Uh, let me see if I can pronounce this. It is always difficult. Average with Gloucestershire, Cardiff, Metropolitan, and Greenwich. Is that okay, Michael? That was uh, impressive. <laughs> A few days ago, we successfully completed the implementation of the learning analytics processor running in Elastic Map Reduce, which is Amazon's cloud based Hadoop environment. Uh, this finishes my presentation now. Let me pass it on to Kate. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to try to tie it all together here. So you've heard. Michael go through the strategy of what GISC was trying to achieve, as well as the solutioning of what the architecture looked like. You heard I tell talk through the science, so the actual um, science behind the predictions that are being deployed within the GISC ecosystem. So I have the uh, next step of sharing lessons from our interactions with institutions as we've um, started to engage directly and help them to adopt and to um, through their analytics environment. 
So first, just a quick summary of the progression of engagement by institutions in, in the UK. We spent a, a good amount of time for the past couple of years talking to institutions about this analytics offering and gathering interest through a variety of conversations. We had about 101 kind of uh, institutions raising their hands saying, yes, we're interested in engaging on this. From that, 35 of the schools officially engaged, so they said, yes, we'd like to do something um, in this ecosystem. And to date, as a team, across the different offerings, we have delivered or are in the process of delivering 24 discovery activities, and I'll talk about what that entails, as well as 12 actual technical pilots with plenty more planned for the next year. So the, the lessons from the field that I'm going to be sharing are really from these last two activities, discovery and pilot. What is the discovery activity? So in practice, it's, it's a readiness assessment aimed at measuring organizational maturity with regard to analytics. The purpose is really to help institutions identify their readiness um, and identify the areas that they have some room to develop and basically take steps to improve in those areas of need before they get too far down the path. The instrument that we use uh, was developed by, by Unicon in concert with GISC. We measure on 26 different factors and those are grouped into both organizational factors as well as technical, and I'll share the outcomes of both of those. From the assessments that have been completed thus far, we assess that approximately 60% of the institutions are ready to implement learning analytics technologies, with the other 40% having large obstacles that we've recommended that they work through first before they start implementing, but their implementa implementation strategy is completely up to them. I wanted to mention, in case you didn't catch it, if you do receive the Educause Review publication and you're interested in this topic, there is an excellent article in the September issue called Moving the Red Queen Forward. It's by Eden Dahlstrom. And uh, it talks about Educause's maturity measurement instrument and the research that Educause is producing around readiness. And the instrument that they use lines up almost directly with the one that we use. And they're coming to similar conclusions about the readiness or lack thereof of institutions in general around analytics. Uh, talking, so moving from the discovery activity to the pilot activity. So during the architecture review, Michael mentioned there are two parallel offerings currently, one a commercial package and one an open source suite. And just built in this adoption flexibility by allowing institutions to choose the solution that was going to best suit their needs. So if you look at the activity column in this slide, this shows just a sampling of the pilot activities that institutions have chosen to, to pursue. Most of them are doing that discovery activity, that readiness assessment up front. And then from there, there are pilot adopters of just the commercial offering. There are pilot adopters of the open source offering. And then some choosing just pieces of the solution, like the student app integration with the LRW or technical integration more generally. So coming to our trends here, so uh, as I said, the instrument that we use in discovery measures both organizational and technical, so I'm uh, sectioned out these trends accordingly. Um, and here are some of the things that we're learning from the actual um, readiness we're doing with schools on the ground. When we talk about organizational aspects of readiness, you could really be talking about any implementation that requires cross-campus coordination. It's a classic change management challenge. Schools are finding that directive and support needs to come from the top. The more change friendly the institution is, the easier the conversations are around incorporating analytics into an organization's existing processes, such as an advising workflow or adjusting a data use policy. We're also finding that teachers and lecturers really want to see the hard facts around how an analytic solution is going to help them before they fully embrace it and, and incorporate it into their current process. One of the real critical lessons learned coming from these readiness assessments is just a very simple acknowledgement by each institution of what type of institution they are. So acknowledging early where their leadership's coming from, whether they do change well, et cetera, helps to prioritize the list of to-dos coming out of the organizational review, and it helps them to acknowledge and sort of tackle the hardest things first. Some of the tactics we're seeing schools use to address some of these organizational trends and challenges are uh, establishing committees around learning analytics. Those committees are really charged with supporting and leading change within the organization. 
especially changes regarding process and policy. Uh, many of the schools are gathering representatives from every department that they can within the university to help create those communication paths, and that includes students. So students being a part of the community is really important too, so that the students can kind of help advise on the ways to soften the message and make it more digestible to the student population. Second, uh, a lot of the schools are adopting, adapting, excuse me, rather than creating new policies around data and data usage. So if they already have a data use policy, they're incorporating um, wording in there that allows the, the consent for learning purposes rather than trying to create an, an entirely new data usage policy to govern their analytic strategy. And then finally, um, schools are, are really looking for, you know, how are we going to actually deploy this? How are we actually going to manage this? And so pilot is um, a big tactic that's being used to test drive the solution and to start to understand how it can be folded into existing processes. On the technical side, the trends that we're seeing out of our work directly with institutions, uh, the primary the primary lesson here is that most institutions are finding they don't have the infrastructure or the process in place that makes that a unified data view and data management possible. Uh, Dr. Laureate talked about data quality, but data quality issues are very, very common, especially as these institutions start to aggregate data from multiple disparate sources for the first time. Um, you know, the inconsistency of the data attributes across the system, variability in things like LMS tool usage, all these things impact the effectiveness of data mining and predictive modeling, and that's a, been a, a big challenge for these schools to tackle. Second is integration. A uh, key issue here is integrate as institutions are looking to incorporate the analytic strategy mostly into an existing system infrastructure that they already have. That's exposing challenges of integration, so um, how standards are going to be used, how those integrations are going to be facilitated, sort of having to figure that out as they adopt different pieces of this analytic solution. And then finally, I'll just mention no technical implementation would be complete without an acknowledgement that tech staff is often already stretched thin. And so how do we add yet another thing into the same technical staff? A few tactics to share here that we see schools employing. First, I'll just mention JISC has an onboarding guide that has been developed and we can actually share that out as a resource after the webinar. Um, but that's to help facilitate early data audit, audits and quality checks and kind of iterate through that process um, so that schools can sort of understand where they have data holes and then go in and fix those and kind of iterate on that data quality to get to the level that we need in order to make the rest of the downstream applications work. We're also seeing two patterns emerge um, on the technical side in terms of some schools wanting kind of an all-inclusive offering around the, the predictions, wanting a vendor to come in and say, you know, this is, this is a, a component and we're going to sort of give you an outcome, give you a prediction. Um, and at the same time, we have other schools wanting to kind of pick and choose just the pieces that they need to integrate into their existing technology. So depending on the solution that schools are opting for, some are, are looking for more hands-on help from vendors and some are looking for more of a do-it-yourself approach. And last, I will share some of our trends out of the pilots. So those were all trends out of discovery. Um, and these are a few trends that we're seeing out of the actual technical pilots that are being run at this time. Um, so just designed this as a national framework for analytics. And I really like the use of framework there because each school is kind of approaching this as a custom solution for themselves. So just has provided a lot of different options um, both for the schools as well as for vendors who want to kind of tie into this this framework and so that's giving a lot of flexibility for schools and it's I think that that is a, a product of good listening that just did because schools are taking just up on um, the ability to customize and to really take the pieces that meet their own institutional needs we're seeing Customization interest not only on the predictive modeling side, but we're seeing it um, in the dashboard, as, as Michael mentioned. We're seeing it um, in the data warehouse itself. So schools wanting to store data that uh, the LRW wasn't originally designed to store. So having to kind of adapt to that has been um, one of the big takeaways. And schools are interested in actually leveraging some of the APIs to integrate with their own systems. 
kind of outside of what the core analytic structure provides. So uh, flexibility has been a key takeaway from the pilot effort. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're seeing schools do a lot of evaluation, how to fit those just pieces into their existing infrastructure, and then only adopting the pieces that they need. Uh, because the GIST solution is so modular, these schools are able to take this pragmatic approach to not introduce more than they need and further tax their technical staff. Finally, we've covered the data story already, but just to touch on it here, uh, as schools are preparing for these pilots they're experiencing firsthand how difficult it can be to gather all the data and ensure the level of quality. And as a, a solution provider, we've had to work with the data in stages as the schools were able to provide it. And kind of incrementally work on the predictive model, for instance, so you can see how flexibility both by the institutions as well as by vendors or solution providers that are providing in this space is really a key to it. I feel like that was a whirlwind. Uh, thank you for, for listening to the strategy, the architecture, the roots of our predictive model, and then some of these early points from the field. Um, we're happy to take questions. I did want to mention that there's a conference coming up in March, the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference, if you're interested in this space um, and want to find yourself in Vancouver in March, please join us. I know that Maris does have a presentation or paper they'll be giving there. Um, and we are actually inviting questions via the chat module. So if you have any questions that you'd like to pose to any of us here, um, interested in more detail about any of the components, We'd be happy to take questions at this time. Kate, I'll just add one extra pitch in for LAC. Um, we're, we're running a hackathon before LAC a couple of days as well. So if you're interested in getting hands on with any of the things you described here, have a look at the hackathon. Great. Yep. Let me give my, my sales pitch in, the, in this case. We are presenting a full uh, technical description of the mall and the <laughs> transition of a single node architecture into a cluster computing architecture. So whoever is interested in, in the technical details beyond this, this presentation today, you can find it interesting at that. I'm not seeing any questions so far. Um, you do have email addresses that are on the screen here. If anyone has a, a question after the fact and you'd like to pose it to any of us, uh, we have included emails so that you can find us. Oh, I do have a question that looks like popping up, so we'll wait for that to come in. Mm -hmm. so the question is, is the project open source? So, uh, Michael, do you want to address the components that are open, versus open source versus open? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, it, it's a mixture. So at the centre, um, learning the Learning Records Warehouse is based upon a product called Learning Locker, which is open source. Um, the additions that we've added aren't just because they are completely UK specific, so not of use to anyone else. The, the plugins that we developed, the um, Moodle plugin is open source. Um, the Blackboard plugin um, is not at the moment. Um, when we move up the stack, then um, the elements based on the Aperio um, open source framework are so the Learning Analytics Processor, um, Student Success Plan, and the Dashboard, Open Dash, are all open source. And the student app, we're just in the process of moving that to an open source model at the moment. And Michael, if folks wanted more detail on where they could find those, the GitHub locations, they could drop you a note or me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and we could point. In that direction. Great. I think then there is another question coming in. Yeah, yeah. question about the data analytics portion. Please go ahead. All right, do the models only use one school's data or are they using some sort of HAM or MLM estimation? I don't, I don't know exactly. Uh, well, if by HLM you're referring, if you're cre creating a multi-level modeling, uh, that's an interesting question actually. Uh, and it's something that we thought about doing uh, at the time. At this point, uh, the way in which we have seen this 
is to train the model with the data from the specific uh, institution. Uh, the reason being that uh, when institutions are considerably different, mixing data uh, to uh, create a training model in order to deliver a predictive model will probably create a bit of a wash. So uh, if the schools are considerably different, you shouldn't be creating or uh, training models and then making predictions on an, a different institutions with data coming from a pool of institutions. Now, having said this, it could be the situation of a collection of institutions that uh, have a certain number of similarities. And in that case, you could create a hierarchical uh, model of some kind. It doesn't have to be linear. I mean, I understand the idea of HLM uh, and it's enticing in the sense of perhaps uh, uh, considering uh, common coefficients or common intercepts. Uh, we have been considering other nonlinear activities, like, for example, creating a tree of uh, linear regression of uh, logistic regression model. So we have been studying that possibility. But again, for that, we should consider institutions that have similar uh, uh, considerations, similar demographics, similar outputs. Just to give you an idea, Maris, for example, which acted as a testbed for the development of lab, has three to 5% of students at risk in any given semester. Some of the uh, pilots that we run in this uh, historically black uh, colleges and universities and the two community colleges, the numbers were dismal. I mean, we were talking about uh, um, attrition in the order of 50, 60, 70 percent. We saw turnovers in one of the institutions of about 94 percent, and we really thought that it was a mistake, and it was not. So in that case, we shouldn't be pulling that data within the data from Aris, for example, because in a way, and to make a metaphor, it's like saying, I have a, a vase with very hot water and a vase with very cold water. I put it together. What I get is lukewarm. So that means that my ability of coming up with good predictions is not really going to be great. Hope that answers your question. Looks like you have a follow-up. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe that's a, a Michael question. That's, I think that's a Michael question. Right, in terms of the JISC architecture. Yeah, okay. So, um, the, the way it works is that um, so the um, data itself isn't shared between the institutions, but the model can, can be. Um, to create the models, we um, de-identify the historic data um, before passing it to Maris, um, just because under EU legislation, the historic data has got under a slightly different kind of um, governance, essentially, because the people are no longer students. So um, we can share the models, um, but not the actual data between the institutions. Does that answer the question? Uh, from a US perspective, I can add the following, that in every case in which we have worked with other institutions, data is always anonymized in the sense that whatever data we're using for training purposes doesn't contain any, any kind of, 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 of uh, evidence that could allow uh, uh, someone to trace back to a particular individual. So Michael, the follow-up there was the aggregate results are available but not individual level data. Um, no, not between institutions. Um, so basically nothing is shared between institutions, certainly in our, in our um, environment. So the legal agreement is essentially between the institution and JISC um, and um, Unicorn Marisca's suppliers, um, the data can be shared between any of those groups um, dealing with some of the issues we have to do with transferring data out of the EU, um, but not between the institution. 
So the model essentially runs on, on the institution's data only on behalf of the institution. And I could add to this uh, in this way. If we decided in the future to consider groups of universities that have similar characteristics, in a similar way of what sometimes school districts do when it comes to using hierarchical linear model, which I think was the original question, in that case, the mall themselves are just an abstraction of the data. So the data is not available. What could be available is the mall that was abstracted from the data. But really, the mall is a collection of parameters that has no identification whatsoever to any of the students. So at the end of the day, if we were to see that these malls, by pulling data from a number of institutions, work in a better manner, and these malls could actually be applied in the future to these same institutions to make predictions into the future, the institutions would at most have the malls that were trained with a pool of data, but again, the malls are uh, completely un un unidentifiable from the perspective of a certain student, They're just a collection of numbers, really. Yeah, um, although um, it's a little bit European-centric, I'm happy to share the general um, kind of legal approach if you're interested to get in touch. So the question comes from a, a school district perspective. Yeah, I can imagine that the question was coming from, but because yes. it's very typical with school districts is to, is to, in a way, use HLM to pull data from a collection of supposedly similar or more or less similar school districts, as much as possible. Great. We will pause for just another couple of seconds here for any other questions. All right, I'm not seeing anything come in, so just want to say thank you to everybody who was interested and joined in. And um, if you do have follow up, please feel free to get in touch with us. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you to my co presenters as well. Great, thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you. Bye. Bye.